the most important thing where to start is, is just determine who do you want to be and who can you be, right? And, and where are you today? And sort of just look at that gap. I think it was Abraham Maslow who said, you know, what one can be, one must be. Hi, I'm James Taylor, business creativity and innovation keynote speaker. And this is The Creative Life, a show dedicated to you, the creative. If you're looking for motivation, inspiration and advice while at home, at work or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's an author, musician, entrepreneur, performer, designer, or thought leader. They'll share with you their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, and much, much more. You'll find show notes for this episode, as well as free training on creativity, over at jamestaylor.me. Enjoy this episode. Hey, it's James Taylor here, and I'm delighted to have on the show Darren Gold. Darren Gold is a managing partner at the Trium Group, where he advises and coaches CEOs and leadership teams at many of the world's most innovative companies, including Roche, Dropbox, Lululemon, Sephora, Cisco, eBay, Activision, and Warner Brothers. Originally trained as a lawyer, Darren has also worked for McKinsey & Co., been a partner at two San Francisco investment firms, and served as the CEO of two companies. He is the author of the new book, Master Your Code, The Art wisdom and science of leading an extraordinary life. And it's my great pleasure to have Darren with us today. So welcome, Darren. James, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. So share with us all what's happening in your world at the moment. It's uh, busy, but like really good busy. Uh, right now, I'm actually um, spending some time with family in New York. And so I've had a chance to see this wonderful city and spend some time uh, with my family doing that. And uh, Professionally, it's a very it's been a very full start to the year. Um, the launch of my book uh, late last year, and uh, work with some really wonderful organizations. I have, as we'll probably talk about, the privilege to work with some incredible leaders of really uh, a really great group of companies. So that that's keeping me very busy and very fulfilled. So to take us back, how did you get into this world of advising and coaching CEOs and leadership teams? It has not been a direct path, <laughs> like most things in life, I think, uh, at least in my life. Um, I uh, have a, a really mix of experiences in my background, including being the CEO of a couple companies. Um, and that led me to uh, finding what is this incredible firm uh, where I'm a, a managing partner, which is a firm called the Trium Group. And uh, it's been around for 22 years. Its mission was and continues to be to change the world by changing the way business leaders think. And it's one of the few firms in the world that really brings together two disciplines that I think for the most part continue to be separate but need to be integrated. And that is the, the discipline of you know, sort of traditional strategy consulting where you know, strategy execution consulting. And then the, um, of course, related discipline of how do you get human beings in a system to work together effectively, call it, you know, human performance or human potential, deep sort of transformational work. And this firm has brought those two things together. Uh, and that was really, as I was leading companies, what I was trying to do. Um, I was sort of obsessed with this question of like, how do you build an extraordinary organization? And uh, so I found a home for me to really fulfill my own mission of doing that. And, uh, you know that that was that was sort of very uh, some circumstance and good luck got me to got me to where I am. Now you're in New York just now. Um, my wife and I've been watching a show called Billions. I don't know if you've ah, yeah. to, to watch it. There's a character in that show. Um, I can't remember her name. She's fantastic. She was in, been a number of really great TV shows. Before. Yeah, and she is the performance coach for uh, for um, Axelrod, the, the one of the lead characters, the hedge fund managers as well. So it, does, is your life look a little bit like that when you're working with these very uh, high, you know, large egos, these kind of, uh, these kind of uh, very senior executives that have a lot of ego and they have a lot of uh, challenges in what they're trying to do? Yeah, I think it's, um, the show's great. I do watch it. Um, and there's some similarities, I think, for sure. But of course, like most uh, of entertainment, it's, it's really dramatized. Um, there, you know, I, it's amazing. I think it may be one of the big misconceptions, which I'm, I'm sure you know about, which is our, you know, most CEOs, even of very high profile companies, are very normal people. They have the same fears and concerns and insecurities and issues that, uh, any one of us has. And so 
Um, I've yet to, you know, meet a person like Axelrod and I'm not sure I really want to, <laughs> but, uh, but, um, nevertheless, I think the commonality is that, um, leadership is this, you know, privilege and responsibility. It's complex. And I think what the show does really well is it, it, it makes a very important point, which is the thing that sits between being an average leader and an extraordinary one is the psychology of the leader. And um, you can have all the you know, skills in the world, but if you haven't mastered your mind and you're mastered your psychology, whether that's, whether you're leading a hedge fund or you're leading a big fortune, you know, 50 organization, you're going to have a hard time uh, really doing it well. And I think that's a, that's a, that's an important point. Now in your, your new book, Master Your Code, you kind of pick up on kind of different things, some things that are kind of in the zeitgeist just now. Um, I guess I think about things like neuroplasticity, how you are not, you can, things can change, uh, mm-hmm. or you have people like, uh, Carol Dweck, you know, fixed mindset and, uh, the different types of mind, uh, mindsets. Um, what made you want to kind of write this book and people that haven't heard about master your code, just tell us a little bit about the kind of premise itself. Yeah, the premise is, and I start the book with two definitions. The first is a, is what I call program. Uh, so I use this the computer program as a metaphor, and the the basic assertion in the book is that every one of us um, has a set of subconscious safety based beliefs, values, and rules that really automatically drive our behavior but limit our results. And you know, I argue in the book that. Um, through much of our childhood, we construct, we don't do it consciously, but we construct um, rules and beliefs about ourselves, about others, about how the world works. And these rules and beliefs aggregate into what I call this computer program. And we're basically living life as an adult in a complex world, running on a program that was written you know, by a child. I say in the book that I was almost 40 years old when I woke up to the fact that I was living life being run by a program written by a seven-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. And this notion that we have a choice, and I call it the human superpower, to really reconstruct, re-architect our program and consciously construct a code. And that's this distinction that I offer the readers, which is a consciously chosen set of beliefs, values, and rules that are purposefully designed to really serve us and produce extraordinary results. And um, this awareness that we actually can make it all up, we really can construct our own, you know, reality, um, is I think the human superpower. And when it's done intentionally, um, it can be it can be a game changer. I know it has been in my life and the work that I do um, with business leaders. And the book basically argues that there are ten essential lines of code, and each chapter is dedicated to each of those lines of code. So I'm not a coder, but the coders I do know, they often yeah. talk about, um, you know, they're, they're having you know, the, the clean code or, you know, there, yeah. there's, a, there's a, you can, you can almost tell someone's fingerprints in, in the code of the way they do things and whether things are very uh, uh, refined or, or not. So let's, let's take people on that kind of journey. Let's imagine that that 40 year old, they've suddenly picked up this, this computer, which is your, our brain. Uh, it's been programmed by a seven year old. Yeah. You are a 40 year old who's had a bit more kind of understanding you you've gone through different lives. What, when kind of looking at some of those, those codes that have been programmed in there, what are the first ones you tend to work with the clients to kind of either kind of strip out that code completely, rework it, make it much more efficient and effective what are those maybe those beliefs or those rules that we're that are holding us back from being the kind of people that we, we can possibly be and the leaders that we can be? Yeah, I think the, the most important thing where to start is, is just determine who do you want to be and who can you be, right? And and where are you today? And sort of just look at that gap. I think it was Abraham Maslow who said, you know, what one can be, one must be. And that's really like essentially the purpose of of being a human being is, you know, to be self-actualized. So it's really understanding what's getting in the way and then finding what part of your program um, is limiting you. And I offer, you know, in one of the chapters of my book, this notion that um, of, of a survival strategy, that when you're a child, um, most of us have some sort of, sort of trauma. It could be serious trauma or what I would call kind of lowercase t trauma, which is you were teased or bullied, which, you know, is not insignificant. Um, and in that moment where you feel excluded, when you don't feel loved, when you don't feel safe as a child, you, we develop 
um, one of three primary survival strategies. And for me, I share an example. I was, I was born in London, England. I came to the US, Southern California, uh, when I was eight years old and I was teased like mercilessly for my English accent. It was cool to have an English accent in Southern California if you were 18, not so cool if you were eight. <laughs> so, you know, in that moment, I didn't know it, right? It was totally subconscious, but I declared that I had to be likable. That was my survival strategy, what I call a belonging strategy. And I did everything I could to become really good at being likable. Uh, it became an incredible strength. I had an enormous amount of personal and professional success early on. I had this sort of likability strength, this likability superpower. But I found um, much later in life that it had been limiting me. So obsessed was I with the need to be liked that I found it very difficult to give clear and direct and honest feedback. I robbed people of, of feedback. I diluted the message I was giving to people that were on my team. And then ironically, because I was so likable, people hesitated to give me constructive feedback. Um, and so I, got, I robbed myself of my own development and growth. And so these are like one of many things that can stand in the way of what does it look like to be fully expressed as an adult so that I have more range. It doesn't mean I give up being likable. It just means I begin to expand the beliefs to allow for more. And so I can go into a conversation now and not be as concerned with being likable. And guess what? I tend to be more likable, right? When I'm honest and authentic and, and direct and clean in my communication. So that's the kind of thing that we work on. Yeah. And I've heard, actually, I was listening to something the other day with Alec Baldwin. He had a guest on his, on his show. Um, and this, this actor that was talking about the show, she said, something you often spot in a lot of actors have been either military kids or they're kids of executives who work for companies like IBM where they've had to travel around a lot. Mm -hmm. So as a kid, you get very used to going to a new city or a new country every few years, uh, being plumped in that, plumped in that school, uh, knowing no one and how to have to kind of quickly build relations. How do you, you say likable? How do you be likable very quickly? Yep. Um, and she said, one of the interesting things about that you kind of build up in that kind of survival instinct is you quickly realize that your self, she was saying your self-worth is not necessarily coming from other people. So she said she would go to, she would land in Germany with her parents and they would go to one school in Germany and uh, none of the kids particularly liked her at that, at that school. And then a year later she would go mm. to another school in England and suddenly she was like the coolest kids in the school. And she said, she said, I'm the same person, <laughs> but mm. kind of what's going on there. But she said all throughout that, you kind of get to see that things are malleable, but then there's also this, if you're not careful, it can quickly kind of go into that sense of how, what do I need to shape myself like in order to be liked by other people? Yes. Right. And that's, and that's sort of the flip side of, of, of a strength is I, you know, my self-worth and sense of safety, psychological safety is dependent mm. on others. Um, could be one way of making meaning of that kind of environment. So, you, you know, you, this, it's a great example. And I think what it does is it begins to illustrate how we make meaning and um, the rules that we create. And the, the key is that we're not conscious of them. I'd say in the book, this really short story, I think it was David Foster Wallace, who told the story of these two fish swimming by, uh, an older fish swims by and says, hey boys, how's the water? And they both look at each other and they go, what the hell is water? <laughs> And so it's a great you know, metaphor for, you know, we are swimming through the waters of our beliefs and our conditioning and our culture, and we're not even aware of it. So part of the, um, the, you know, this, the strength of being really effective in life, whether you're leading, I, you know, I like to say you're leading an organization, you might be leading a family, but you're certainly the CEO of yourself. So everybody's leading something and CEO, you know, you're leading yourself may be the most important leadership role you have. But having awareness um, is so critical because you can't change what you can't see. And um, it really begins with being aware of, wow, there is a whole set of things that I made up. I didn't even know I made up. And here's where they're serving me and here's where they're limiting me. And I can be in choice about reconstructing you know, a different, different parts of that. And that's, a, that's very powerful. And in the book, you also talk about not just the psychological side, but actually how you can use your 
your physiology, your body yeah. to control your, your brain's kind of default response to a situation where that's being that CEO in that boardroom and something's happened. You've got to kind of deliver those results not going so, so well, or you're kind of in that situation where maybe you're an entrepreneur and you're, you're pitching, you're putting your pitch to a, to a, a VC and you're trying to kind of, you know, you're getting that, you're getting res- things coming at you and how to kind of respond to those. Can you talk a little bit about that, about the, the kind of the physiological side of this? Yeah. Thanks for asking. It's such an important um, asset. I, I, I say it's the most under leveraged asset um, you have is your physiology, right? We rarely think about, unless you're like an elite, an elite athlete or a performer, how do I use my physiology, right? To really optimize my performance. And yet, the body sends a very powerful signal continuously to the brain. And it sends one of two signals. It sends, says I'm either safe or I'm in danger. If it sends a signal that says I'm in danger, part of the brain called the limbic system or the amygdala where your fight flight freeze response center is located gets triggered and activated. And that's great for physical survival, not so great for being at your best. Um, You see less data, you're less focused, you're, less able to self-regulate, um, less creativity, right? You're going into your sort of um, so, you know, survival animal instinct area of your brain. If your body sends a signal to your brain that says, I'm safe, your prefrontal cortex goes online. And that's where all of your best thinking occurs, where your executive function is, where emotional intelligence uh, is enabled, um, where creativity resides, um, where you're really literally at your best. And so, I often work with um, people to really begin to master their physiology. Like right now, you and I aren't seeing each other, um, but I'm smiling and I'm doing it intentionally first because I'm having a good time in the conversation. But my, when I'm smiling and my posture and body is open, it's sending a signal to my brain saying, this is fun. This is safe. You can be at your best. And the quality of our conversation will go up. The other thing that happens that's really important, particularly if you're leading or you're trying to influence people, when you walk into a room, your physiology matters. And I often ask leaders, I say, when you walk into a room, do you raise the level of anxiety in the room or do you lower the level of anxiety? And most people will sort of sheepishly admit that they raise it. And, and a lot of it has to do with, are you coming in? What does your physiology look like? Because as mammals, we co-regulate, we mimic each other. And we can affect the whole mood and energy and therefore performance of a room just in terms of how we're using our posture, our facial expressions and our breathing. So it's a very, very important um, thing to attend to. Now you mentioned there about creativity and the the role of the kind of prefrontal cortex as well in your own creative journey, you know, for example, for, for um, writing this book, uh, was there a time when you were kind of working on it and something, it just, it wasn't going right. Cause writing a book is, you know, it's a marathon affair. Yeah. Uh, so maybe t- tell us about that so people can get an understanding of your own, your own process, your own creative process. Yeah. I, um, it took me sort of two years start to finish and it wasn't full time cause I have a full time job, um, writing my book. I tend to writing comes easy to me. Um, thankfully I'm really um, blessed to have that as a gift. Um, I, made a commitment, um, and I talk about commitments in the book, that I would write my, the first draft of the book in, in a year. And I'd written a letter to my son that really catalyzed um, the writing of the book about essentially like principles for living a good life. He was about to go to college. And it really resonated with people um, that read it. So I said, okay, that's going to be the construct. So it took me about just under a year to write the first draft. And I was really pleased with where the first draft landed. But you know, like most first drafts, I mean, it's, you compare the first draft of what the book is today, and it's like, a, it feels like a distant memory. I went through um, two major rewrites of the book that um, kept some of the content, but really found a way to like get really coherent and cogent. And, but I got stuck at least a couple times. Um, and I remember on the second rewrite it was just not coming together it wasn't holding together in a congruent way for me and um i'm a big believer in like turning things off going for walks you know my my best thinking occurs when i'm not thinking about the thing i want to be thinking about and it literally i i was literally on a walk when this idea of computer program code came just it literally just came to me and 
Um, I was like, yes, I think that's going to work. And then I just sort of, you know, got back to my house, sat down, looked at each chapter against that metaphor. And uh, I was like, yeah, I really landed on the thing that's going to kind of hold this book together. So you were kind of going back and forth between, I mean, that's actually that process you were talking about there of actually spending a year writing that, um, that first draft that that's, that's, that's very usual in, in fiction writing, but not so usual in nonfiction. Uh, most nonfiction writers, I normally know they, they kind of have a, this kind of rough idea that they send to a, a literary agent and then they get it signed to an editor and then only then do they actually start to, to write the book. But you kind of had such a very strong idea about initially what you wanted to do with this book. You kind of went straight to actually writing it. Yeah, very strong idea. I'm also a, a prolific reader. Um, pro- I could probably say without exaggeration, 250 plus books um, that really are the foundation of this book. So I, I just, I'm, and books have changed my life. So for me, it was a very personal endeavor. You know, my, my, it had to be my writing. I, you know, I hired a wonderful editor at the end of the process before the book got published and, and she did some wonderful work around tightening. But um, for me, it was, I, I wanted from, more than anything else, actually, the act of sitting down and writing and that sense of accomplishment of having written something myself was really what motivated me to, to begin, um, you know, regardless of what happened with the results. Now, in, in doing that, you, know, you, you got busy, you're, a bit, you're doing, working with these uh, different CEOs, these executives in the company. Uh, when did you find time to be able to, to do this right? And what did you find worked for you? Um, I, mostly on the weekends. You know, I would just carve a few hours out. And, um, and then, then sometimes just like, you know, I'll, I'll admit like on my train ride into work, you know, I had, had an idea and I couldn't help but, you know, sit there and and write. So there were little, little patches of that as well, but it was usually on the weekends and uh, my children were kind of old enough where it, I had, I had a little bit of space to do that. Um, and again, it, it, it didn't, I didn't struggle to get that first draft out. Um, I really had a sense of what I wanted to write and um, it was just about getting enough time to let it come out. Going through that, that two year process of ideating, writing the book, going back, when was the, I said someone like Seth Godin would call it the dip, the, <laughs> the darkest moment, the, the approach to the cave uh, in this whole process. When, when was that, that most difficult time for you? And what do you do to kind of come out of that? Because you coach people all the time. What kind of self-coaching were you having to give yourself in order to kind of push through that period? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I would call it a, a shallow dip. Um, I didn't have that one, like, you know, the depths of despair kind of moment where I was like, you know, reassessing whether I should even, you know, do this. Um, I think it was probably that time where I just was struggling to, like, the the chapters weren't tied together. Um, they weren't tying together uh, the way that I wanted. It didn't feel like a coherent book. It felt like, you know, a dozen really good ideas that had kind of some loose thread pulling them together. And that was when I, when I was like, I just can't quite figure out what this is going to be. And I had multiple attempts. And so, um, you know, the, the coaching that I was giving myself and the coaching that I give everybody is, it's, it is around the power of mindset and belief. And so, you know, for me, I had some frustration and some challenge, but underneath it all was a constant re- reminder um, that I have a gift to give to the world. I'm going to write an extraordinary book. Um, by the way, whether that's true or not is sort of irrelevant. I say in the book, it doesn't matter whether the belief's true or not, it's whether it's gonna serve you. And that was a belief set that was certainly gonna serve me um, through this, this two year process. And so I just kept reminding myself, I had done the work, I was prepared. Um, I had some, an important message um, and, uh, and that really helped me. And by the way, that was not the identity I was holding before writing the book. I think many reason why it took me so long to get a book written, um, and decide to write a book was because I was holding an identity that I wasn't an author. And I talk about the power of identity in the book. Anybody who's holding an identity that subconsciously that I'm not an author is going to talk a lot about writing a book, but is not going to get around to writing one. And so I had that earlier, um, and I had to really um, transform my identity around being an author. I think I think it was, was it Austin Kleon said a lot of people want to be the noun without doing the verb. And yeah, <laughs> it's, it's the, they want to be speakers without speaking. They want to be, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, entrepreneurs without, without actually building businesses and shipping stuff as well. It's is that is that challenge. Do you, you're in uh, you live in in Silicon Valley and and that whole kind of world where things are moving very fast all the time. Is there an online resource or a online tool or an app uh, like Evernote, for example, that you find very useful in the work you do? Um, in the work that I do, pro- not really. Um, I mean, there are. I would say, you know, there are, there are people that I'm working with um, that want to become, you know, more mindful and want to take up meditation uh, as, a, as a practice. It's not sort of the core to what I do, although I do meditate daily. Um, so there's some great, you know, apps out there, Headspace and Calm are, are two of them. Um, even just the embedded technology in your phone or, um, you know, on, on your watch around, I think, you know, Apple has a breathe app that will remind you just to consciously pause. But those are a few of the technologies and apps that, that I've found to be helpful. What about if you to recommend one record, one album, and one book to our listeners, not your own book, what would those be? Oh, wow. Um, I would say, let me start with the book, because um, I'm more of a bibliophile than I am an, an, an audiophile. Um, I would say, uh, a failure of nerve by Edwin Friedman. It's, uh, uh, probably the number one book that I recommend to the CEOs that, um, I have the privilege of, 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 of coaching. It's a 20 year old book, but it's timeless. And I think it's actually even more timely, uh, now. Um, and it's, uh, so pr- it's such a profound read that it's hard to, to synthesize it. So I'm just going to leave it with that kind of strong recommendation. Hopefully it's, it'll tantalize your, your listeners. Um, and I, uh, I'm, you know, I've gotten more into Bruce Springsteen later in life. I listened to his memoir, you, you know, he, he wrote and, and recorded the memoir on audio on an audio book. Uh, and so I've been, uh, I've been both fascinated with him as just cause I study extraordinary people, um, and listening more into him. So I'd probably say born to run. Um, you know, Bruce Springsteen's album. Wonderful. Um, and Darren, I want you to imagine you woke up tomorrow morning and you have to start from scratch. So you have mm. all the tools of your trade, all the knowledge that you've acquired over the years, but no one knows you and you know no one. What would you do? How would you restart things? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I, I think I would continue to do what I do. I, I know I would continue to do what I do. Let me be a little bit more declarative. I say in my book, there's this great Japanese framework called Ikigai, what I love to do, what I am good at doing, what the world needs and what I can get paid for. And I think I found my Ikigai in the last decade of my life. And um, so I would, I would ha- you know, I'd rebuild um, reputation and brand. Um, and I think in many ways have a lot of fun doing it, you know, without, um, any of the baggage, right, of, uh, of uh, the last 50 years of my life, um, even though it's been really wonderful baggage. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I would, I would do that and do it um, with all the knowledge I have. It would be super fun to start out. <laughs> so Darren, where's the best place for people to go to learn about Master Your Code, the new book, and also to learn a bit more about you as well and connect with you? Yeah, so uh, the book's on Amazon, paperback, hardcover, um, Audible, Kindle. Uh, so you can go to Amazon, uh, Master Your Code, and find it there. Uh, and uh, I have a, a website, Darren J. Gold, D-A-R-R-E-N-J-G-O-L-D dot com. And you can go there for more resources. And join my, I do a weekly uh, email. You can join my mailing list there and learn more about me and my work. Fantastic. Darren, thank you so much for coming on the show today, sharing with us all about your creative life. And I wish you all the best with the book and all the best with all your coaching work. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. I appreciate you having me. If you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.